going to be in uh, John chapter 9 tonight. I want to start probably with Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, and you're going to kind of wonder why I'm starting with that and then going into John 9, but hopefully we can tie it together a little bit. How many believe in purpose? That everybody's born with a purpose and for a purpose. How many realize that it's not so much about your being birthed into the earth as much as birthed into the kingdom when you realize what that purpose is? Does that make sense? We'll go into that a little deeper in a minute. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says, to everything there is a season, a time, everybody say time, for every purpose under heaven. Let's just stick with one. One will be enough. To everything there is a season. So there's a season for everything, and then there's a time, everybody say time again, (laughs) for every purpose under heaven. I want to talk about tonight, we'll go on into John chapter 9, and I, we might just go through the whole chapter of chapter 9 of, of the book of John before this is over, not tonight, but there's just so much in this story. It is one of my favorite stories, but I woke up really early this morning and the Lord impressed me to come to the church and just spend some alone time and and this is what I come up with today and really spoke to me. And I was kind of joking around when I prayed earlier about getting it off of me. But uh, I was convicted and convinced this morning with some things from my own life personally, but just in general and about our culture and things that might really help us. And so I, I think this will be a good thing and it'll help a lot of a lot of us even here tonight and and people watching as well. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And then he makes a statement that, that, that got me, and I want to go into this deeper tonight. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. I'm going to go back and focus on verse 4 where it says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Has anybody ever wondered what Jesus meant by that? What night? What night was coming that he was talking about? There are several things to bring out in this short set of scriptures. And so I want to take my time and just see how far we get tonight on this. Um, But first off, I want to talk about the blindness in the story. How many can see that there's more than one person blind in this story? There are two people blind in the story, or more than that, actually. Um, First off, I want to talk about the blindness in the story, the two blindness issues Jesus is dealing with here. Number one is the man born blind, obviously. It said that there's a man born blind, and um, I want to talk about this physically and metaphorically because I believe this is something that he's speaking to not only me but to the church as well. Metaphorically speaking, to me, this symbolizes a person who can't see at all or simply has no vision, right? I mean, the guy's born blind. You could metaphorically say it's like people who can't see. But I want you to notice something. He's been blind since birth. He's not been able to see since he was born. So he's never had it. So he didn't even know any, he didn't know any different. I mean, you know, you can't be mad at somebody or upset at somebody when they don't know, right? 
And but and I keep trying to jump ahead on where I want to go with this. So you can't be mad at somebody who doesn't know. So metaphorically, we have people that have no vision or they can't see certain things. And sometimes people get frustrated who do have vision or do think that they can see a lot like the disciples with this man. And they start judging them or wondering what your problem is or what's wrong with you because you don't have any vision. What's wrong with you because you can't see it like I see it? And so they instantly, um, people can be spiritually or emotionally blind. Those people are people who are unsure, unaware, or uninterested in vision or purpose. And you can tell who these people are by how they manage their time. If you can't tell, I'm going to sneak in the time management tonight. People without, who, can't, who don't have vision or they're uninterested or they're unaware um, or they're unsure of their purpose, they're easy to spot and tell because of the way they manage their time or don't manage their time. People who are uninterested in God's purpose or plan or vision ultimately have made an idol out of their own time or out of their own. Now stay with me. It's going to go kind of deep here just for a second. And the reason God doesn't want that for us is because he knows how disappointing idols can be. It's not that God's such a jealous God with the idol thing. He said, I'll have no other gods before me, and he doesn't like idolatry. We know that um, all through Scripture. But I think the, one of the reasons is, is he knows how disappointing it will be. It's no different than us with our kids. When our kids get so enamored with something or so caught up in something and we know that they're going to spend their time their energy their efforts and they're going to throw themselves into this thing and then they're going to hit the end of it or hit the wall and get disappointed does that make sense and so uh just just keep that in mind and we'll keep going forward with this so you have that setting going on with the blind man or people who just have no vision and then you have the blindness of the disciples the blind man had been blind since birth, but the disciples had a blind spot. Jesus had to heal the disciples' vision first because they were blind to what was really going on and could not see it. And this is exposed to me by the question that they ask. Can we go back up to uh, the first part of that? Verse 2. And his disciples asked him, remember what they said? Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't get on to them either because of their blind spot any more than he does the guy that can't see because they're both blind, amen? And one of the things that Jesus said that he'd come to do is to open blinded eyes. That was one of the prophecies about Jesus. This is what he said he would do the first time that he opened the scrolls. And he, he quotes Isaiah, but he adds the part about opening blind eyes. And so how many know that you can open blinded eyes more than just in a physical sense? You can open blinded eyes to people who have no vision. You can, God can open blinded eyes to people in the physical, in the emotional, or in the visual side, a spiritual side of something. But he said, can also open our eyes to blind spots. Anybody ever have a wreck or a car accident because of a blind spot? Back into something. It wasn't that you couldn't drive. It wasn't that you didn't know most of it, but you had a blind spot. So here's the disciples, and they've got the blind spot, and their blind spot is bad theology. Because their theology and their understanding was somebody sinned because this has come on somebody. Never judge people's condition or situations in their life because something bad happened that they did something wrong. Bad things can happen to good people. Amen? Bad things happen to people who have done nothing wrong. Bad things happen to people going to do great things. Rich is mom. Think about that one. Or you guys all probably have people that you know. So you can't worship God correctly if you see him wrongly. And the disciples were suffering from bad theology given to them probably by good people. And this is something that we get into a lot with discussions of people who come from different backgrounds. And when they finally see Jesus or get a vision of Jesus for who he is and how he is and, and the new covenant and understand all that, that 
they realized they had bad theology. And we all have had it in one way, shape, or form. The, Je- the disciples were running with Jesus Christ himself, and they still had some all the way to the end. Amen? Even right towards the end of his ministry, they're still bucking for position of who's going to sit by him. Talk about immaturity. They've been with Jesus Christ on the earth for three and a half years, and right before he's going to be crucified, they're still worried about who's going to sit close to him. Like little kids. You know, have you ever had your kids try to, try to push each other out of the way and try to run, and they all jump at the same time try to get in there? That's what I feel like with those disciples. It's like, seriously? And then, one, and then there, one, a couple of them's mom even jumped in on it. Remember that? So they were just like you and I. Good, well-meaning people with bad theology, and that will cause us to have blind spots sometimes. And that's why we need to be careful when we get too harsh or too condemning on other people or we get to throwing out stuff too quick. Amen? The Bible says slow to speak. But one of the problems we have today is everybody's so quick to speak and slow to think. Amen? We don't think before we speak. We speak before we think. And therefore, we have all these problems, and then we end up looking stupid or hurting people instead of helping people. Here's the situation with the disciples. The disciples could not see the real reason he was blind because of their blind spot from their bad theology. Nobody had sinned. He was simply born this way. I don't know who would pray with me tonight. (laughs) Lord, help me see past my blind spots. That's what I began to pray this morning. I said, Lord, help me see past my blind spots. Help me not to be so quick to judge people when I see people who, who just have no vision. It's frustrating when you're a visionary person or you have a vision or you feel like you're trying to really push this thing that God showed you and then other people aren't catching the vision, even though you're trying to explain it. Or you see things for their life that they could be and could do. Or God might even speak to me about some people and they don't see it. And I get so frustrated, I just want to shake them. I want to spit in dirt and rub it in their eye. <laughs> Jesus did it in this story. Maybe we'll get to that later. But anyway, nobody had sinned. He was simply born this way. So spiritual maturity is when you can disagree with yourself. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about sitting around arguing with yourself. Spiritual maturity is when you can disagree with yourself or your old self. Let me put it that way. It's when you can realize that you had blind spots or misunderstanding and can disagree with your old self and then change. And we talked about this recently about people who just won't change or people like truth. We talked about the truth issue, about truth challenges us. And we go through the five stages just like we do when somebody dies, through the stages of grief. When we hear truth and it confronts untruth in us, this is basically a continuation of what I talked about Sunday. When truth confronts untruth, we have to go through this sequence of denial, anger, then we try to make a deal, and then bitterness, and then acceptance. And it worked the same way with the disciples. Here they are, and they just pipe off. Well, who sinned, him or his mom? I mean, good grief. Think about that. If your parents sinned and it caused you to be born blind, wouldn't you be mad? I mean, you come out and you're like, thanks, Mom and Dad. Way to go. I didn't do this. But spiritual maturity is when you can disagree and then move on and change. There is another aspect here of the story that will tie in with time management. And that is the issue of being busy with things that have nothing to do with it. I'm going to say that again. Being busy with things that have nothing to do with it. What's the it? Your purpose. My purpose. The situation. The disciples were busy with something that had nothing to do with it. Have you ever met somebody who was so busy messing or dealing with things that had nothing to do with their purpose, and you're just watching them thinking, when are you going to quit jacking around with that and get into what you are? When are you going to go ahead and answer the call and follow your giftings and follow the things God's blessed you with and it's obvious in your life what you are. But they just keep trying all these other things. Number one, they can't see it. They don't have the vision. They're not accepting it. They're not believing it. They may be in that kind of a place. And again, there we go, not to jump on them too quick, but the disciples were wasting time on something that had nothing to do with it. And I want to move from this part to get to the part to see the great example that Jesus was and how cognitive he was at time management. This just 
come out of this thing. And I say this because of the statement that he makes in the text in verse 4, but I, I want to come back. I had another thought right here about they were wasting time talking about theology when the guy just couldn't see. He was hurting. Have you ever got in a situation where you went to pray with somebody or you, you went to try to minister to somebody and somebody else went with you and you get ready to pray for the person or you get there to minister to somebody who's hurting, they've just lost a loved one, they've been in a wreck, they've got a sickness, they've got something going on, and you get ready to do it and the other person wants to start talking the theology with them or you, and you're like, can you see they're bleeding? They don't need a theological sermon right now. What they need is somebody to help them. What they need is somebody to pray for them. And I, I, I've mentioned this, I think, once here before. When Cassie and I went through uh, a, a bad situation in our life where we, we ended up losing everything and we had to be out of our house within 24 hours is what they told us at first. And so here we are. We have all these friends and spiritual friends, super spiritual people that are supposed to be our close friends in our life, and we have this traumatic situation that happens to us. We have to be out of our house in 24 hours. We have a semi-trailer parked in our yard, and we're scrambling trying to load what we can and, and everything in our the semi-trailer, and I have my phone ringing off the wall, which it was a cell phone. I guess it wasn't on the wall. Of all these friends trying to sit here and tell me theological ideas what the bank should have done how things should work this isn't right this isn't fair and all this we had one couple show up who weren't real spiritual and finally he looks at me and i'll never forget his name was mike i hope he's watching he looks at me and he said you want to give me that phone and i said yeah i think i need to and he said hang it up and he said you know what amazes me Everybody wants to tell you what's wrong with the situation and what's going on, and this is how it should have been, or this is how it shouldn't have been. And he said, right now, all you need is somebody to help load a truck. I said, thank you. And we threw the phone aside, and we loaded the truck. It's the same way in our life. We can get so caught up in trying to be theologically correct or get up into that, whether whatever it is or what we know, that we miss the point somebody's bleeding. Amen? The disciples were wasting time on something that had nothing to do with the situation. And Jesus is going to take the situation. He already made this statement that, um, go ahead, next verse, verse 3. He answered, neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. This is why this happened. What if we would look at situations in people's lives with the thought process of, I wonder how God's going to, re re <clears throat> I wonder how God's going to reveal himself in Taylor's tragedy. Instead of, boy, I wonder how that happened. Wonder what she did. Well, that's what she gets, you know, because after all, we remember. I'm making this up. But Amen? But Jesus was very cognitive of, cognitive of time management. And I say this because of verse 4. He said, I must work the works. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because night is coming. Night is coming. Jesus is teaching a principle here that I think we miss. I've missed it. I never saw it till today. It's called time management. And I would have never thought in the midst of this story of a blind man and blind disciples that Jesus is teaching time management because he makes a statement. I mean, you realize everything Jesus said was vitally important. One of the writers said that if we tried to write down all the things that Jesus said and did, there wouldn't be room enough in the world to contain it in the three-and-a-half-year period that he did ministry. So the stuff that did get contained in the Bible, in the scriptures that we have, is vitally important. So he says this, and he says, The night is coming when no man can work. And it's just a principle I'm after with this tonight. How many people ever feel like you just don't have enough time? <laughs> Nobody in the room. All right. Maybe the people online. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus is saying that he has limited time. How many know Jesus knew he had a short time? He knew that his time was short on earth and he needed to not be messing around with stuff. He said the day's coming when, when, when there, no man is going to work. Or the night is coming when no one can work. I need to make the point. I need to get this across to people. I don't have, in other words, I don't have time for anything that's not my purpose. 
The disciples are wanting to talk theology, and Jesus is going, the guy's blind, let's get him healed. And matter of fact, while I'm healing him, I'm going to show you your blind spot at the same time. And then I'm going to teach you a little time management all mixed in that. How I many know that's how God does it? It's never about one little thing. It's about all kinds of stuff. He says, I don't have time for anything that's not my purpose. Or another way to say it is, I don't have time to be busy with things that have nothing to do with it. Somebody was hurting, and the disciples wanted to talk about theology. Jesus understood that night was coming and that our time won't last forever. You know, the Bible says that our days are numbered. And I begin to think about time. We're all given a measure of faith, and we're all given an amount of time. We just don't know how much it is. And so the question is, what did we do with it? What are we going to do with the, the amount of faith or the measure of faith that God gives you and me? Are we going to compare it? Are we going to theologically? <laughs> I went totally blank there. Are we going to discuss it theologically and argue about that? Or are we going to just use what we've been given and use it for the kingdom and the glory of God? Same thing with our time. Jesus is not anxious here, but he understands urgency when he makes a statement. Jesus is not freaked out because the Bible says be anxious for nothing. Anxiety is not from God. But urgency, sometimes we need to be urgent. I have a relative that is a flight nurse on the life flights. And he told the story of one time where he had to do the emergency thing where you stick the deal in their neck to whatever that was. And it's a very dangerous thing, and it's kind of a once in a... I mean, you just got to make a decision like that or somebody's going to die. And he had to do it, and he did it, and it worked. Sometimes when somebody's hurting or somebody's bleeding or something needs to be done, there, we need to be urgent about it. Now, I'm not talking about being in a hurry all the time in ministry because you know my theory on that and what I believe that he came to give us rest. And the rest was from the works. And those works are works trying to get approval from God, but not the works of doing something for the kingdom, not the works of fulfilling our purpose, because we need to do that. Time is an invaluable asset that must be managed. You ever thought about that? Time's all we really have. That's it. And how we manage it determines a lot of stuff. So don't waste time. Say this with me. I ain't got time for that. And that is anything that doesn't have to do with your purpose. In practical terms, I don't want to end up at the end of my life and realize the people that meant the most got the least amount of time. I do not believe God wants you to sacrifice your family for your purpose. Because if he gives you your family, that's number one. Amen? Next to him. And then your purpose. Then your business. Then your ministry. Then the other things that you do. Jesus only lived 33 and a half years on this earth. And his ministry time was only three and a half years. Think about this with me. And he changed the whole world forever. Three and a half years. That's one bad time management guy. Amen. Could you imagine God sitting down with him, the father and saying, Jesus, here's the deal. I need you to go to earth and I'm, we're going to, you know, throw you out in the manger and the shepherd's going to come. And the angels are saying it'll be neat. And we're going to do all this. And then I need you to just stay quiet for 30 years. I mean, don't raise the dog from the dead. Don't walk on the pond. Just play with the other kids. Do all that stuff. I just need you to be normal. And then we're going to just expose you one day in the River Jordan and we're going to tell everybody, boom, here he is. And then you got three and a half years to change the world. Hmm. Wouldn't that be fun? And Jesus says, all right, game on. He's the best at time management I've ever seen. And I'm not just talking about physical years, but in the kingdom, birth dates are different. There's a day when we're born physically, and then there's a day when we're born into the kingdom. Your purpose is connected to your birth into the kingdom. When you realize who God is, what Jesus did, and that we all have a purpose and we're all born with a destiny and thing in our life, most of that, our God-given purpose, I believe, is realized after our birth into the kingdom. And I want to share with you five keys that I believe will help us. I'm going to call them the five R's of time management. Okay? We'll get this done in five minutes, one minute each. You ready? 
I'm lying. Five keys are the five R's of time management. Number one, we have to reclaim our time. We have to reclaim it. Whatever has your time is not going to give it back. You have to take it. Whatever has been taking your time and have, has had your time and my time is not going to just give it up. We have to take it back. We have to repossess it. We have to reclaim our time and say no more. Remember the scripture that says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine? It's the little foxes that ruin the big picture. It's the little things that we waste our time with and that we spend time doing that have nothing to do with our purpose that end up taking us away from our real purpose. I just thought of another story where I'm guilty. I had a construction company, and we were running wide open. And we were having a lot of trouble getting rock, and we used a lot of gravel to fill, fill foundations, and then we poured slabs on for houses. And so I come up with the great idea. I needed a dump truck. And so my friend built dump trucks. And I was with him one day and happened to see this real shiny when he was building. And I was like, hey, that's what I need because I can hire a guy, put him in that truck, and then I'll – uh, he'll be my guy. He'll haul to my stuff all the time, and I can keep him pretty busy, but in, if I don't have him busy, I can always lease him out to asphalt companies because they were always pouring roads and, and, and redoing roads, and you could just lease on and off daily with those guys. So I thought, this is great. I'm always going to have my gravel guy. I'm always going to have rock when I want it because I can. he works for me. And then I'll lease him out the rest of the time, so it'll be a moneymaker too. I created a job. I mean, this l looked great, didn't it? And I convinced myself it was great until Wayne called me. And he calls me one day and he said, hey, can we go to lunch today? I just, I need to talk to you. I said, about what? He said, I just need to talk to you. I said, okay. So we go to lunch and sitting there visiting. And he's asking me what I'm doing. And I'm telling him what I'm doing. And I'm telling him I'm about ready to buy that dump truck. And he just stops and he looks at me and he goes, this is it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, don't buy that dump truck. I said, what? He said, you're not supposed to buy that dump truck. I'm telling you, all I knew is I was supposed to meet with you. I wasn't sure what it was, but I'm, this is it. Do not do that. And I said, you don't even know what you're talking about. I need this. I had reasoned it all out. And they say little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things that steal our time, steal our, steal our energy. It's not, it was not that it was a big thing. It was a little thing, but it would steal. And so I ended up going ahead and ignoring the word and doing it anyway. And so I buy the truck, hire the guy, great, we start, first rattle out of the box. Something happens on the truck. He ruins two tires. Next thing I know, something else happens. Something else happens, and it's little stuff. And I've got, I'm spending all my time messing with this truck when I need to be taking care of six or eight houses at the same time. The whole idea was so he could help me, but it was that little fox that kept spoiling my vine. And the next thing I know, I realize I'm spending more time with this truck that's supposed to be helping me, and I'm losing all my time and losing control of my jobs. It's the little things. It's the sneaky foxes that steal our time and waste our time. And I don't need to start. Do I need to make a list? Just in general. I won't say Facebook. Um, anybody ever check the time you spend on Facebook? Isn't that scary when you see how many hours a day? Some people could have a whole other career. It's their second job. Some of them spend more time on that than their real job. And then they say, well, I just don't have time. And I say, give me your phone. That's my first response to anybody that tells me that now, just word to the wise. Don't tell me you don't have time. I'm going to ask for your phone. Why? Because I'm guilty. Amen? You look at that and you just think, I can't believe I, there's no way. I did not spend that much time. Yes, you did. And you gained absolutely nothing. You didn't straighten anybody out. You didn't fix anybody. You didn't change them, their political views. Matter of fact, you probably fought with somebody and made them mad. Or they made you mad because you saw what they said or did. And then when you get together, Cassie and I talk about this. It used to be when we come together with church or we'd have a fellowship dinner or something, everybody start visiting and finding out what was going on and what happened. We don't have to talk about nothing. We knew what you did on the way to church. 
I mean, we get in there and go to eat, and everybody just kind of eats, and then they go home because there's nothing to talk about. I already know what you did. I know what's going on in your life. I know what your kid did three days ago. I know what your car did. I know what happened and how much it cost to fix it. Because you told everybody. Say, little foxes, to spoil the vine. It's a little things. It's a waste of valuable time. <laughs> you can make your own list. I just used one. It can be many things. It can be people who want attention but not help. Have you ever had someone who wants your attention but they don't want your help? <laughs> Am I on anybody's stuff yet? They want your attention but they really don't want your help. They just want to talk about their problem but they really don't want to change it. People in our lives who wouldn't listen but then when their lives blow up, they want you to make it an emergency for you. It's an emergency problem. Oh, pastor. You've got to come here. What you said was going to happen, happened, and it just blew up. Yeah. Well, see you in three days. I told you this was what was going to happen. I'm just using an example. I'm not saying that happens all the time. Just a story, okay? And don't make me out to be bad. Jesus did it. <laughs> People who want their negligence to create your emergency. Say, little foxes that spoil my vine. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. But if you let the little foxes keep gnawing, how many know it takes away from your vine? Tell your neighbor, I don't have time for that. Even though Jesus did not waste time, he also never let that happen. Remember Lazarus? I told you he did it. Oh, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. He's your friend. Jesus is like, all right. See you in a few days. And people get so mad at me if I don't respond quickly to situations. And I, I just think, well, Jesus left Lazarus till I mean, he knew he's going to die. He just let him die. And you got a hangnail. <laughs> he knew the situation, but he didn't move on it for days. Why? Because he knew whatever or whoever has your time is not giving it back to you. You have to reclaim it or take it back. And in this situation, it was sickness that had attacked his friend and it was going to take his life. But Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to use this for an example. So number one, reclaim your time. Reclaim your focus, your attention, etc. Reclaim your time. Another time... Uh, I'm kind of on the wane kick tonight, but another time he called me and he said, I had this vision of you. And he said, you're like looking through this scope and you just keep having to adjust. And you look through the scope and you get the little adjustment on the top. He said, I keep seeing you. He said, you need to keep your focus because focus is my issue. I got ADHD. So I have to keep my focus. We all have to keep our focus. So we have to reclaim our time, our focus, our attention. Number two, reorganize your time. These are the three R's. Number one, reclaim your time. Number two, reorganize your time. This means developing a plan for my time. Without a plan, time is wasted. If you don't have a plan, time just runs away from us. If you don't have anything to do, you'll sit and watch movie trailers for two hours. I know some things about people sitting here, but... I'm going to confess, Cassie and I, we have got to the age where we don't really like the movies anymore. We just like to watch the trailers. <laughs> and then we got bored with trailers. And I know this is stupid and I'm going nowhere with it. But if you don't have a plan or you don't have a, a, a plan to use your time, you'll waste it. And the next thing you know, you look at each other and you think, well, we got off Facebook for two hours, but we watched trailers for two hours <laughs> and we didn't even we could have watched the whole movie. But now we know we don't want to watch 18 or 20 of them. If you don't tell your time where to go, you'll wonder where it went. <laughs> i got some one-liners here. If you don't tell your time where to go, you'll wonder where it went. How many people have said that? Where did the time go? Well, you just opened the door and let it out. Take dominion over your day and organize your time. 
So many people want to take dominion over spirits and, and the stuff over the city. And, and some of the super spiritual people are like, we're going to pray over the city and we're going to bind and we're going to take authority over all this stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But some of that could be solved if, if the whole group of people would just manage their own time and do something. It's like, you know, we're going to bind a spirit of starvation. and Well, open a food pantry. You wouldn't have to bind it. you just feed them. Amen? <laughs> Sorry. Don't tell your time where to go. It'll tell you where to go. What about taking dominion over your day or your time? Even in the morning. Get up in the morning. It even includes how you talk about your day. <laughs> I'm too close to too many people. <laughs> good morning. How's your day? Well, it didn't start out very good. Well, then what? Well, it's probably going to go bad. Anybody ever been around with people like that? This includes how you talk about your day. You can say things like, this day may not go perfectly, perfectly but it's going to be productive. This may not go the way I had planned, but I'm going to pr be productive at the end of it, and it's going to be a good day. Amen? That's how you take dominion over your day instead of saying, boy, this day's going to suck. I mean, it started out bad. My cough, I mean, I didn't get my coffee. I've got a headache. My boss was mean to me when I got to work. My wife's acting like, you know, why she acts. And I mean, it's just thing after thing. I mean, this day's going to be horrible. No. Don't give life to that. Don't give word to that. You form your world by your words. Take authority over that time. Why? Because I have vision. Without a vision, the Bible says people perish. In that verse, and you might have heard me teach this before, but in that verse, the word perish, without a vision, means a revealed word from God or a revealed word of God, which is Jesus. Without the revealing of who Jesus really is, people perish. Doesn't that make sense? He's a living word without a word, without a revealed word, without revealed Jesus to us. People perish. But did you know what the word perish means? It means cast off restraint or self-control. I didn't really mean to cast off that. Hello? Still there? Hello, there we go. I'll stand real still. Why would I take dominion over that? Because I have vision. Without a vision, the people can. I take dominion over this microphone. You better get me a cordless. Something's blowing up here. But it's going to work out good. Amen? Think about this with me for a minute. Without a vision, your microphone gets scratchy. Testing. There we go. Without a vision, people perish. The word perish means to cast off restraint or self control. Think about that for a second. Self control. Anybody ever heard that before? What is self-control one of? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Without a vision, people cast off a fruit of the Spirit. Why is that so important? That means you're throwing off fruit. People without a vision are fruit throwers. How about that? You bunch of fruit throwers. Don't say you're blind. Just say you're throwing fruit, man. Quit throwing fruit. What's so important about, why it's so bad about throwing fruit off? Because how many know if you throw away fruit, fruit's really actually the seed for another harvest. Self-control is the seed for a harvest. Because without self-control, how many know you won't really ever have a harvest? Think about it with money in the financial situation. If you don't have self-control with money, how many know you'll never build up anything? 
You'll never do good business. If you don't have self-control with your tongue, how many know you'll eat the fruit of that one too? You'll raise up some fruit of that uncontrol, that stuff you cast away, that self-control that you just threw out there. And you, is this making sense? Without a vision, people throw off fruit. They throw off one of the fruits of the Spirit. And it, to me, it's one of the most valuable ones of it. Self-control. Stop throwing fruit and start planting it. Stop throwing off self-control and start planting self-control. What? <laughs> Help me, somebody. Too many people are throwing off self-control and restraint or fruit that could produce something for the kingdom and doing it in the name of freedom. How many have seen that lately in the world today? Everybody wants to be free, even in the church, the grace movement. It's all greasy grace, just free. Don't judge me. I'm going to do whatever I want because God's just going to bless everything I do. No, he's not. God's going to bless his purpose. God's going to bless his plan. And we have a choice whether or not to get in line with that plan or not and just cast off self-restraint and just do whatever we want and then try to get him to bless it. How many know that's called a prayer amiss in the scripture? We pray amiss. That's a whole other message. God gave us all time. What did we do with it is the real question. If God himself had to organize his time, and he did, what makes us think that we don't have to? See why I didn't like being in the office early this morning? Jesus was not randomly born. Think about this for a minute. How many know he was planned? From the foundation of the world, just like you and me. How many know he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? He was planned, prophesied, and produced. Just like you. You were planned, you were prophesied, and you were produced. God knew you from the foundation of the world. He knew the plans he had for you. He knew from the foundation of the world, and he prophesied it, and then you became produced because all children are a gift from God. And if they're a gift from God, somebody made the gift. Somebody planned to give the gift to a family. Somebody planned to give that kid to you. Somebody planned to give you to your parents, and it was him. Tell your neighbor you're a gift. You're a gift. He was planned, prophesied, and produced. Hundreds of years before God planned, before God planned Jesus to be born, and it works the same for you and I. God worked for six days, creating everything, so he could rest on the seventh. He planned it. Don't you think so? Or did he just get up on the seventh day and it's like, oh, well, I guess I got everything done yesterday. No, I think he planned it all. And he said, six days shall a man work, and on the seventh he shall rest. Part of the problem we have is we got people that don't want to rest. They want to rest on the seventh day. They don't want to plan and work six days and then have to take a day off. And I know I'm kind of <laughs> getting on a... a uh, a soapbox here, but when I grew up, Sunday was sacred. Not even just to church people, but to secular people, the world, even the whole world. All businesses closed on Sunday. All businesses took a day off. Farmers used to give their field a rest every seven years. Why? Because it's the principle of God. You work it six years and you let it rest a year and heal up. Or you let it, it changes the whole conformation of the soil. It changes everything. But not us, buddy. We're going to spray. We're going to double crop it. We're going to just keep hammering that thing out. And then we wonder why all of a sudden we're in the mess we're in. We do it with our personal life. Why? Because we don't schedule. Remember when we didn't have some. <laughs> this is anti cell phone message. Remember when we didn't have cell phones? We had to actually plan our day. Even in our business, in my in, in construction business years ago, when we didn't have cell phones, you had to plan and think and organize and load all your tools and figure out what supplies you needed for the whole day because you're going to drive somewhere and you're going to be working and you don't want to waste more time and money driving back to get something you forgot. So what'd you do? You had to think. You had to plan. You had to schedule. But not when you got a phone. I'll just call somebody and they can bring it. I'll just call the lumber yard. I'll just call one of my guys. I'll just call this. And we didn't have to plan anything because we thought, well, if we forget, we can just always do this and this and this. And this become a lifestyle for all of us. 
to where people don't plan anything anymore because we always can just fix it with our phone. We can just fix it with our, we can just order something else. We can just, we can just do it on the fly. And there's nothing wrong with using technology. Please hear me with that. You can plan and use technology. We plan tonight to use a phone so people could see online. That's a good thing. Amen? But when it becomes, we become obsessed with all that, When I was young, I started to work for the electric company. And I had, a, I had a brother-in-law that was building and building duplexes. And I realized that you could build a duplex if you subbed it out yourself. You could build it for what the bank would loan you for it. So you could get a loan for what it costs to build it, and you could sub the thing out, and then you could move in one side and live in that side and rent the other side out for enough to pay the payment or almost pay the payment. So for a young couple starting out, that's a great deal because you can have a nice new place to live and it's only $100 a month, say. I'm just throwing that out there. Because the other people are paying rent and they're paying most of your payment and your insurance, so you just got to cough up a little bit and you got a nice new place to live and it's being paid for by somebody else. And I'm thinking, this is a great idea. So I said, let's do this. And then I got a bigger plan. I thought, I'm working, I got a great job, I've got benefits, I'm gonna have kids, they pay for our, you know, they pay for the birth of the kids, we have great insurance for all that stuff, you get free babies, free dental, all this kind of stuff. So over the next 10 years, I'm gonna build one at a time and rent them. I'm build one, move in, then I'm gonna build another one and rent it out and then I'm gonna just keep building and I'm gonna get 10 of them. And I'm going to take all the money that comes in as much as I can and put back on them. And I had it figured up. They'll pay out in 10 years. So in 10 years, I'm going to have a $10,000 a month income. And somebody else paid for it. Does that not sound like a great plan for a young couple? to think? <laughs> Cassie was, hey, man, that's a great idea. So while we're having kids and all the expense of having kids and all that, I'm going to work for the company. They're going to pay for everything. And we're going to do this on the side. And I'll just do one at a time. I can handle that. And I started. And then the guys at work found out. And they said, hey, would you do one for me? And I said, well, if I'm doing one, I might as well do two. We'll just put them beside mine. And then three. And then four. And then five. And I'm driving down the road in a service truck, got a cell phone laying on the dash, the big bag phone, and I got a phone in this here, and I got a microphone in this trying to run outages and doing all the 40 or 50 stops I have every day, and I'm going stupid. Why? Because I didn't manage my life. I let other people's distractions and taking advantage of the gift that I had reorganize my plan and my time to the point it stole it from me and they still enjoyed the benefits for themselves because they were just going to work and somebody else was building them something to do just what I said. I didn't manage. Does that make sense? If you don't realize or recognize the value of the plan and purpose for your life, sometimes others will take advantage of it. And it's not that they're evil people. They saw an opportunity and took it. And if I was willing to do it, bam. But if I would have just said no, I could have stuck with my plan. But I got to the point I got so busy that I couldn't keep up with any of it. And then when the economy got stagnant for a couple years, I hadn't built up my stuff enough to ride the thing out. The same goes for reorganizing. <laughs> you have to reorganize your time or you'll have way more time. If we reorganize your time, I got something in the wrong place. Number one, reclaim. Number two, reorganize. If you reorganize your time, you will have way more time than you thought. The same goes for reorganizing your space. Anybody ever feel like you had a cluttered garage or a cluttered space in your house and you reorganized it and realized you had a whole lot more room in there than you thought? It was just unorganized. Reorganize. If you reorganize... Um, you'll have more space. If you reorganize your health, you'll have more health than you thought you had. If you reorganize your mind and soul, your relationships, your tools, your friends. Come on, somebody help me. If you reorganize, you'll have more than you thought. Sometimes people tell me they don't have any friends, and I said, well, just get a piece of paper. Let's start writing them down. And they start writing them down. Well, I got this friend. Well, that's really a friend. And that was, well, actually, I got six. 
Now you got more than you thought. Why? Because you just organized them and you put them on a piece of paper. When Wayne came here years ago, he said, if you'll just let me work with you for a little bit, he said, you'll wonder what to do with all your time. Because he said, you really don't have a time problem. You have an organization problem. And if you'll organize your time, you'll have more time than you thought. Amen? Number one, reclaim your time. Number two, reorganize your time. Number three, reinvest your time. You can reclaim, reorganize, but how you invest your time is where the return comes from. You can be all reclaimed and reorganized with stuff that has nothing to do with your purpose. I'm not trying to be negative. You can reorganize. It'll look really nice. You can reclaim it and all that. But if you're, doing, if you're still doing things that have nothing to do with your purpose, you're not accomplishing anything. You're just being busy. I mean, if the devil can't get you to be bad, he'll get you to be busy. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I know people who are ate up with organization. But what they have organized makes a pretty calendar. It looks nice, but it has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with their purpose. So my question, did you invest in the things that mattered most to you? Don't get depressed. We're going to pick up at the end. Did you invest in the things that mattered to you? I could get all depressed about my duplex plan. Because now I'm 30-some years down the road. I should be retired from that company, but I was going to retire at 34 instead of, instead of I'm still not retired. Amen. <laughs> Did you invest in the things that mattered most to you? All the other guys I built for, they're retired. They're fishing. And three nights a week, I'm crying. And the things that will bring return to your life, I'm not bitter. This is why I always say, start with getting quiet before God every day. Prayer time is managed time. It's priority. You invested it in something that would have a return. Not just crisis prayer time. <laughs> What's crisis prayer time? People that pray when they get in crisis. And only when they get in crisis. Some people pray in crisis while other people pray to keep from crisis. Quiet time, prayer time, is an investment that affects all other investments. Quiet time or prayer time is the investment that affects all other investments. I finally figured it out after a few years in the construction business. When I was so busy and I couldn't think, I couldn't organize all the stops I was going to have to make and make sure this guy had a piece of trim and this guy forgot this and this guy and all these different things that were going on with these guys, I finally figured out I can't plan this out. So I would get up early in the morning and I would go somewhere and I would sit and cry and pray. And I'd just spend time with God. And I just worship. And by the end of my worship time, I would have I had my paper out and I was writing a list. And I planned my day. And then I just started my route. Why? Because the peace of God came on me. And God began to give me wisdom. And God began to give me direction that I thought about something I would have forgot about. But here I am right in the middle of a worship song. And it's like, oh, yeah. And what about this? And I'd write this down. And you could call me stupid if you want, but it worked. It worked. When you pray, you invest in your future. Because prayer is not telling God what the problem is or what needs to be done. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. Not only talking to Him, but listening to Him. When you pray, God will tell you things you didn't even know. He'll give you direction. He'll tell you what's important. Whatever it is, He will speak to you. God will bypass the prayers of your lips sometimes to answer the prayers of your heart. I heard that today and I thought, wow, that's pretty good. God will bypass the prayers of your lips and answer the prayers of your heart. Doesn't the Bible say that even in our prayer time, we can have groanings that cannot be uttered, but he knows what we mean. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that if I get in front of God sometimes like I used to in those days early in the morning and I would just get in somewhere and I would find somewhere quiet. It might have been in my truck a lot of times or sometimes I would go to her dad's church and just go in and lay on the floor in the sanctuary and just weep and be like, God, I can't even do this. I don't know where to start, but I'm just going to worship you. And the next thing, he would start giving direction. And he knew what I really needed and what I really wanted. And he would answer that prayer more than what I was trying to tell him. Some may argue with this, but I believe it's true. Remember when Mary and Joseph left Jesus at 12 years old? Remember that story? 
They thought he was with the family somewhere. They thought they were in fellowship with him, but they were not. They were in relationship with him, but not in fellowship with him. He was still their son, but they weren't in fellowship with him. They didn't know where he was at. They were unorganized. They weren't in fellowship with him. They were in relationship, but not fellowship. This just proves that you can be in relationship with someone, even like God, but not in fellowship with him. He's still my father. I mean, no, you can have an earthly father or mother and not talk to him a lot, not spend a lot of time with them, not be in fellowship with them. You can do that with your kids. It works the same with God. We're in relationship with God, but we're not in fellowship with him sometimes. The Lord has spoken to me about what I would do at certain times in my life, but if I didn't invest the time, it would not happen. How many know you can get all kinds of words from God about what God's going to do and what God wants in your life and what He wants to do through your life and what He's called you to be and all that just because you're called doesn't mean you have the knowledge. Amen? This is some just basic tough stuff that people need to hear because we can get too super spiritual sometimes and and god said this and yep god said over me that i'm going to build this great thing and i'm going to we're going to have this great ministry and or we're going to do this and or he's going to give me this this great husband or uh, he's going to do all this and this in my life but just because he said that doesn't mean that you have the knowledge to accomplish it yet some people get mad when you teach this stuff you can't be called and not have the knowledge to go with it. I do believe in anointing. I do believe that God anoints people for certain purposes and plans and things in their life. People have anointings on their life for certain giftings and things that they have. But there's also knowledge that you need. And we need both because anointing will use knowledge. Anointing will use knowledge. What does the Bible say? My people perish for a lack of what? knowledge there now we got dying again without a vision people perish without knowledge people perish so we need knowledge it doesn't mean that they're not anointed they just have no knowledge and sometimes you need to invest your time in education to fulfill your calling just because God called me to preach doesn't mean I never need to get education and that I never need to read my Bible, that I never need to invest in, in the things of ministry. If I'm called into ministry, I need to invest in that. Amen? In knowledge in that and understanding how to do those things. If God calls you to run a business, how many know you need to get some education on how to run a business? Otherwise, you'll just not manage your time or your business. This is one of the problems in our culture today. Watch this. Culture will cause us to invest in what we put on us, but not what we put in us. Culture, your surroundings, society today will cause you to invest in what you put on so you look good instead of what you put in so you are good. We'll invest in money to put clothes on to cover up our physical body instead of taking care of our physical body so we could wear anything and look good. We'll put a profile on Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is. How I'm just going to stick with Facebook. We'll put, our, we'll put stuff on Facebook and we just show our highlight reel. We just show the good things and we just show all the great things. And if people looking from the outside, they think, man, they've got a great life. And if we just invest in trying to look good everywhere and we don't invest the time it takes to have it be good, we're nothing but a facade. Culture will cause you to invest in what you put on, not what you put in. So we look better on the outside than what we really are. It's not what's on the outside that matters as much as what's on the inside. People say that all the time. So one of my questions is, what are you putting on? What are you putting on you? And what are you putting in you? If you're too busy for God, you're too busy. I'm trying to speed up. We're going to run out of time. If you're too busy for God, you're just too busy. Number four, reset your boundaries. How many know we need boundaries? 
you got to have guardrails, especially when you're racing go-karts. Stay on track, right? we got to have boundaries. You can't wait for other people to get a revelation of what you need or don't need. They aren't that smart most of the time. Well, I just don't understand. Don't they know I need my time? Don't they know I need my space? Don't you know that I need this and I need that? I mean, are you married couples? We're supposed to be mind readers. No, we're not. You have to set boundaries. You have to communicate. You can't control others, but you can teach them how to treat you. Write that down. You cannot control others, but you can teach them how to treat you. I want to explain that. There's ethic and honor and even respect. How many people honestly try to treat people with honor and respect? We really do. You try to treat people like you would like to be treated. You try to give them their space. You try to honor their, their, their boundaries. You try to honor whatever it is that with other people, and that's good, and we should. But just because you treat others with ethics, honor, and respect doesn't mean they'll treat you the same way. This is why you have to teach them. This is why I have to teach other people. Because sometimes I'll give people all kinds of honor and respect and time and whatever it is, but they don't want to give it back to me. And they'll do it to you too. That's not being mean. The culture of the kingdom is a culture of honor, and and that's correct. The culture of the kingdom is a, is, a, is a culture of honor. We honor other people. We honor our guests. We treat people. We, we, uh, the scripture even talks about sometimes we, we didn't realize we entertained angels unaware. That's why when we meet a stranger, we should treat them with honor and respect because it could be an angel. Amen? We can't make other people honorable, though. That used to bother me years ago. You can set boundaries, and you can teach people how to treat you. I heard somebody tell me that one time years ago, and I thought, boy, that's kind of that's arrogant or selfish. You know, I'm going to teach you how to treat me. Like, you're the big deal? I mean, that was my response. Are you really that big of a deal? Because I didn't understand the value of somebody's purpose, the value of what somebody's time is, the value of what somebody else is doing, because I was only thinking about me and what I needed, what I wanted, what I wanted out of that relationship. But you have to set boundaries to teach people how to treat you. Because if you constantly allow no boundaries, you will end up with a mess. Think about it. We call them spoiled kids. They were kids with no boundaries, with no limits. We just let them do whatever they want, whenever they wanted. How many know when they grow up, they are a train wreck? Little Jeffy is cute when little Jeffy's little. But when little Jeffy's 15 and he starts breaking stuff and getting mad and kicking holes in the wall and tearing up stuff, it's because he never had a boundary. They never had a limit. And we have to do that not only raising kids, but we have to do that to protect our time and protect ourselves and protect why. Because you have a gift and a calling on your life. I have a gift and a calling on my life. And if we don't respect each other, we're, neither one of us are going to do anything, accomplish it what we could. And so if everybody would honor and respect. How many know it would be a great place? I'm not responsible for Lene, honor and respect, but I am responsible for mine. I can't change Charmin, but I can change me. Does that make sense? All child development teachers with a brain will tell you that boundaries are the safety for your child. (laughs) In my business, and, and over the years, I've been guilty of this because I just decided, okay, I'm tired of trying to make money. I'm trying to tr- tired of trying to be successful worldly and all this. I'm just going to sell out for God, and I'm going to serve people. I'm just going to serve. I'm going to serve everybody. Jesus was a servant. The greatest among you is a servant. I'm going to serve. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to serve everybody. And I'm going to come here, and I'm a pastor, and I just serve everybody, and I tried it. And I did it for a long time. Until one day, this is a true story. Somebody called me because, man, I'd just drop the hat, go help somebody, go do this, go do that. I mean, they'd call, and I'd come running, drop whatever I was doing, tell my kids, no, wait, I got to go. I got this, this, somebody in the church. I got to take care of them. Until one day somebody called and said, hey, could you come and pick up my trash and take it to the dump? I said, sure, I'll be right over. Didn't even think about it. 
jumped in the truck, drove to their house. This is a true story. Got to their house and started to load the trash, and I looked out on the street. And everybody's trash was lined up down the street. And I said, what day is your trash day? And they said, oh, well, it's today. And I said, how about you just take your trash out to the curb? I wanted to punch myself in the face. Because it hit them and it hit me all at the same time. And I was so mad at myself because I had left somebody important or something that was important that was my purpose and my plan to go haul somebody's trash because they weren't thinking. In the name of servitude. Tell your neighbor that's not serving, that's sickness. Amen? I tend to get so caught up in helping everyone else that I would allow their weakness, their neglect of organization, their deceitfulness, or just ignorance to take advantage of me in my time. And it happens to you too. You teach people how to treat you by what you allow. You have to set boundaries. Never confuse self-sacrifice with self-destruction. We need another hour. Never confuse self-sacrifice with self-destruction. I watch this in relationships so many times. I sit with people that I'm trying to counsel, and I listen to them fight back and forth, and I watch them self-destruct because they, they, they don't want to set a boundary. They don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, so they destroy themselves trying to please somebody who doesn't respect or honor them. Why? Because they didn't set boundaries. They didn't say, you're not going to treat me this way. I'm not putting up with this. Why? Because I'm more important than that. That's not arrogant. That's realizing you have a plan and purpose for your life too, and it's not to be a doormat for somebody else. Amen? Never confuse self-sacrifice with self-destruction. I spent two years one time trying to pour into somebody and work with somebody who could care less. Spending all your time on someone who is not or not willing to pursue their purpose is a waste of time and everything else that you do. I'm bringing this back around. Stay with me. Sometimes you have to be like Nehemiah when he was, when he was building the wall and there were some people that went to him and they're like, hey, Nehemiah, could you come down off the wall? We need to talk to you about something. And he said, no, I'm not coming down off the wall. I'm doing a good work and I'm going to finish it. And he didn't come down off the wall. Now, we would call them arrogant. We would call them self-centered. They're narcissists. They're all this. That's what everybody screams at anybody that's trying to be successful, disciplined, and doing things the correct way. We call them all, the society calls them all these terrible names because what society and culture in general want, or certain people in culture want, is everybody to give them everything, give them all the attention. They don't want to get better. They don't want to change. Just feed me, clothe me, take care of me. Everybody and anybody that's got a brain and that's responsible responsible and disciplined they're the ones paying for everything anyway and i got to get off this topic <laughs> sometimes you got to be like nehemiah when he told the people who wanted him to come down off the wall he said i cannot come down i'm doing a good work boundaries are gates not walls now we're going to turn for a second just because you set boundaries doesn't mean that's a wall and bless god i'm not changing I've got my plan, and I'm not changing. I told you about one of my kids who could not stand a plan to change. But how many know plans change? Life has interruptions. Things happen. I, I begin to look at Jesus. Every time Jesus was interrupted on his way somewhere else, he performed a miracle. He was on his way to Jairus' house. The woman with the issue of blood comes up and grabs his garment. Don't get so rigid in your boundaries that they become walls. Let the boundaries be gates. So that if you are in your plan and you are doing what you're supposed to do, and this is what takes the, the meanness out of this, you're doing what you're supposed to do just like Jesus. He was on his way to heal to Jairus' house to deal with him, and the woman with the issue of blood shows up. If you don't set boundaries, people will drive all over your place. Always allow for divine interruptions. Don't be such a slave to structure that you have to, because you have to leave space for the good thing or the need also, just like Jesus. 
Jesus is walking along. He's on his way somewhere. And all of a sudden, some guy starts screaming, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he had to stop. And he had to turn around. He had to open the gate for something to happen. Amen? Don't be such a slave to structure that you don't leave space for the good or the need. Jesus was on the way somewhere, and many times he did a miracle on his way. Number five, and I'll quit. Number five is recognize God. you got to recognize God. I'm going to try to pick you all up. Some of us can get to thinking we've missed it or we've missed our window. I think I've been pretty obvious with some of my own life stories tonight. You get to thinking, great, now I'm 50 years old, and how am I going to do this thing? How am I going to ever have anything left for me? Because I've given it all away to everybody else. We can get to thinking that we've missed our window and we don't have a chance anymore. We've missed so many opportunities that there won't be any more. But how many know God's a big God and a good Father? God is the Redeemer. He is the Restorer. He is the Deliverer, and He has not changed. He can bring your window back around. He can bring your window of opportunity back around. Say that with me. He can bring your window back around. Why? Because he's a redeemer. I thought about the prodigal son story. It was just that, that same setting. He, was too mature, he, was, he wasn't mature enough at the time to understand what he had. And he went and squandered everything. He didn't manage his time. He didn't manage relationships. He didn't manage his money. And he ended up in a mess. And when he come to himself, the Bible says that he went back. And he was like many of us. He didn't realize that there was more than just one ring, one robe, and one pair of shoes. God's got another robe, another ring, and another pair of shoes, so to speak. He can redeem time like nothing. Your former years can be better than your, than your previous years. The last of your life can be so much better it makes up for the first of your life. Yes, you may have wasted opportunity. You may have wasted time. You may have wasted relationships. But God is a master at bringing it back around just like the father in the story. Think about it. The Bible says that he divided his life to the sons. But by the time the son came back, how many know the father had another ring? He had another robe, and he had another pair of shoes, and he still had his whole house and his inheritance. He still had a business going. That's a picture for us to see. Though we've squandered, though we've messed up, though we've done these things, God's still the God that will still keep you in covenant. He'll still put a robe of righteousness on you. He'll still put shoes on your feet. He'll still treat you like a son. He'll still kill the fatted calf. If God is bringing your window back around, recognize it. And then manage it. And then take advantage of it. Recognize it, take advantage of it, and manage it. I should have said it in that order. God will bring your window back around. Why? Because the Bible says His mercy is new every single morning. Every single morning, His mercy is new. You want to manage your time today? Or do you want to blow it? Do you want to manage your health today? Or do you want to blow it? Do you want to manage this relationship today? Or do you want to blow it? I'll be here in the morning. You want to try again? Isn't that awesome? How many would really like to get that sunk in your head that every morning when you get up, that eraser board is white? Everything you didn't get done, everything you didn't do right. I made Cassie do that one time when we were young because she'd get so frustrated with what she didn't do. She, she thought she had to be perfect at all this stuff, and she, was, she had this list. She'd lay down at night and think about all the stuff she didn't get done, and she didn't do this right, and she was mean to the kids, and, and they're going to grow up and be terrorists, and all this stuff's going to happen. And I'm finally like, get me a freaking whiteboard. Write down everything you did wrong, everything you didn't get done, all that stuff. She said, okay, and I said, now erase it. In the morning when you get up, you go look at that board. It's a clean slate. Start over. It's a clean slate. Start over. That's mercy. Amen? And that's our God. If God's given you this message and you're listening to me tonight about this message and about time management, that means that you have time. So redeem it. Whenever God gives you instruction, He begins to give you empowerment. Redeem 
the time. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the principles of your word. I thank you that even you, Jesus, you knew that you had a certain amount of time. And you needed to be about your father's business. As a matter of fact, even when Mary and Joseph left you, Jesus, your response was, don't you understand? I only have a certain amount of time. I must be about my purpose. God, I pray that every person under the sound of my voice tonight gets a hold of the fact of what I'm saying. That their purpose is important. Their life matters. Their giftings and callings that you've put on them matter. Having time for that matters and you want us to manage it. You want us to reclaim it, redeem it, restore it, replant it, reinvest it, and to recognize it. And I pray tonight, God, that that becomes so real to everyone listening to me. Thank you for the fact that your mercy is new every morning. That your grace is sufficient. And that that window of opportunity comes back around again and again. And again, because you are a God of restoration. You are a God of redemption. You are a God of favor. And I give you praise tonight. I give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.